Right, I'll hand over to you. I'll fade back into the background. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for um, tuning into this presentation. And I'm going to be talking about um, our fund, AVI Global Trust, and discussing it in the context of its focus on, on governance matters. But let me start by saying, firstly, that um, we are not a, an explicit ESG fund. We are a responsible investor and take uh, governance issues very seriously. And in fact, governance goes really to the heart of our, our approach to investing, as I'll discuss with you over the next uh, 20 minutes or so. The presentation. No, okay, so if we go over to the, um, to the first slide. Um, first thing to say is that um, we have a long history of engaging with the boards and the management teams of the companies we're, invest we're investing in. And what we want to see across the board is high standards of corporate governance. And specifically, when we think about the kind of companies we're invested in, which, which can be, as you'll see in a few moments time, which can be controlled by families and other groups of investors. We want to see that those companies are being run in the interest of all shareholders and not perhaps just the largest um, shareholders. Fundamental to this view is the idea that as long-term investors, we want our companies to prosper over the long term. And in order to do so, we have to ensure that those businesses are sustainable and are going to be around to prosper in the long term. So our approach um, to investing um, ha has been around for over 35 years at AVI. We've managed this AVI Global Trust, which was formerly known as British Empire Securities for all that time. And um, in, in all that time, before it became fashionable, our interaction with boards and our um, dialogue and pressure sometimes on governance issues um, has really been at the heart of what we've done in all that time. So um, let's, start, let's start to look at the portfolio and let's start to um, understand exactly what our approach is. So on the next slide, um, what you see here is the, the types of company we invest in. These aren't the actual um, specific companies, but the broad category of company. A lot of holding companies, family controlled holding companies, some closed end funds and some other types of, of company, particularly Japanese companies. And the other thing you see here is the discount at which um, our portfolio is trading at, the discount at which those companies, um, those different types of companies are trading at. And that really starts to get to the heart of our approach to investing. We want to buy companies that are trading at discounts to their net asset value. And all of these companies will have a different reason for trading at a discount. And our job as analysts is to understand why those discounts exist and um, whether they represent an opportunity or a warning to stay away from the particular company. So if we take um, a, a, few, uh, a few general categories here to, in order to elaborate. So the first are holding companies. Now we've split them up geographically between Europe, Asia, South America, North America, but essentially um, the characteristics are the same in whatever geography we're talking about. And that is that these are listed companies where a family shareholder is typically the controlling shareholder and where this holding company owns a series of different businesses. Now, many holding companies, and there are several hundred around the world, trade at discounts to their net asset value. And those discounts move around over time and we focus on them, we analyze them, we try and understand them and try and exploit those discounts when we think they represent a good opportunity and avoid them when we think they're, they're overvalued. But if you, if you think about why a discount exists on a family controlled holding company, governance is going to be at the top of the list because best, you're going to be the second largest shareholder, you're not going to be in control. And realistically, the management and the family will do what they want in terms of running this company when they want and not when necessarily we want. And so for that reason, a lot of investors stay away from family controlled businesses. We happen to like them. We think they're 
that they can be great custodians of capital, they can deliver very strong performance, and they can provide access to world-class businesses. So they're inefficiently priced, they under, they're misunderstood, they're not, they're not researched well, and so that creates an opportunity for us. But the first thing we really need to understand is why that discount exists. And there are examples in all parts of the world where holding companies exist for the benefit of the family and not for the benefit of minority shareholders. And that is a very good reason for a discount um, to exist. So we, our focus on governance here really is twofold. At the initial stages, if we find a company that's abusive to minority shareholders, we probably wouldn't invest in it because they'll probably repeat that bad behavior and we will suffer as a consequence. But in other situations where they generally have been friendly to minority shareholders and have been good for all shareholders, then we know we can't force them to do things that they don't want to do, but we can still engage. We can still encourage them to do good things on the governance front, to be more shareholder friendly, to be more transparent and to help narrow the discount. And the, a discount at the end of the day is a bad reflection on them. It means the market is penalizing them in some way. So often they're very interested in our views as to understand why their discount exists. So that's holding companies. And I'll give you a, a clearer example of that towards the end of the presentation. The other big area that we focus on is investing in closed end funds, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. And closed end funds, as you know, can trade at discounts uh, for long periods of time. And often that discount, again, is a function of concerns over, over governance issues. And governance issues here can range from funds having high fees. A high fee is a way of benefiting the manager and disadvantaging shareholders. It can be a function of the quality of the assets that they own or the quality of the investment strategy or how it's been implemented and concerns about valuations or lack of understanding of, of um, where, where growth is gonna come from. So all of these issues um, contribute to the existence of, 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 a, of a discount. And again, you, you have some situations where boards and managers have been abusive to shareholders. Issuing shares at a discount, for example, is, is something that's abusive to, 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 to shareholders and something that would warrant a trust, an investment trust trading at a discount. And here, AGT's approach is somewhat different to the approach when it comes to investing in family controlled holding companies. Because the key difference here is that we can and often will be the largest shareholder on the register of those trusts. And we want to use that power and that, and that position to our advantage and to the advantage of other shareholders. And so we spend a lot of time with management, of, uh, management and boards of investment trusts Looking at, their, looking at their structure, looking at their discount, thinking about the composition of the board, thinking about their communication, thinking about their fee arrangements, and trying to work with them constructively, proactively, um, in order to address those issues. And ultimately, um, we can be quite aggressive if we need to be, and, and look to implement quite drastic measures in order to remove the discount to the advantage of all shareholders. But again, it's, it's that engagement on governance issues where we see a reason for the um, discount persisting and existing that we, we focus on. Another area, and again, we'll have an example in due course, is, is in Japan. And, and Japan is a very, very interesting market. Um, historically, Japanese companies have not been run in the interests of shareholders. Japanese companies have historically been run in the interests of all other stakeholders. And by that, I mean employees, pensioners, society at large. But shareholders generally have, have come very low down the pecking order. And consequently, management have not really focused on shareholder returns and getting the share price up. And on top of that, um, boards in Japan uh, are way, way, way behind where we are in the rest of the developed world when it comes to independent directors, when it comes to diversity, and when it comes to really seeing the role of independent directors as probing and challenging executive management. Changed over the last five or six years with the implementation of a corporate governance code and a stewardship code. 
which really sought to change the, um, the landscape in Japan when it comes to corporate governance and focus on shareholder returns and shareholder rights. And to that end, we've pursued a strategy in Japan over the last three or four years where shareholder activism is really at the heart of what we're trying to do. It's different to shareholder activism in the rest of the world. Um, it's more respectful, more um, constructive, perhaps restrained in some ways and sympathetic to the way of doing things in Japan. But it's nevertheless entirely focused on the, the, the governance issues and shareholder rights and promoting the interest of shareholders to at least the same level as other, other stakeholders. So if you go on to the next slide, um, I've spoken a little bit about um, our approach across the different areas of our investment focus, why discounts exist, how they relate to specifically to governance issues and why we engage with companies on those issues in order to rectify the structural discounts that, that, that may exist. So in, across all parts of the portfolio, when we look at valuations, when we look at the companies we're investing in, we want to understand why the valuation discount exists. And often, as I've said, it does relate to a governance issue and we want to identify those issues. And then rather than sort of stampede in and go in and, and um, all guns blazing, demanding um, that, that boards listen to us, the subtle nuance here in terms of our approach is that we only will invest in a company where we think there's an interesting valuation opportunity, where we see fundamental value and potential for growth in, in the value of our investment over time. And that allows us to build a constructive relationship with the board because we're not going in there saying you are bad guys, you're abusive to minority shareholders, you're trading at a discount, do something about it. We're saying we like your company, we like your assets, we like what you're doing. We agree with you that those assets will be worth more in five years time than they're worth today, but you're trading at a big discount and that discount is disadvantageous to, to minority shareholders. We think you should do this, that, that and the other. And we're not going to force you today to do it. We're going to work with you behind the scenes. We're not going to embarrass you publicly for the start at least. And we're going to help you solve your problem, which is the discount. And often across all types of companies, whether it's in Japan or family controlled companies and even investment trusts, the fact that we've been uh, an investor in, in these kind of companies for years and we don't have a reputation as being an aggressive, abusive, bullying kind of activist, but more of a constructive activist, um, we can work hand in hand with companies and we can... Ooh. Sorry about that. Um, and we can work with companies hand in hand to, um, to help unlock and create a more value for shareholders. So how do we go about it? Well, um, on the next slide, please. Um, as I've said, at the starting point is to build constructive relationships, to have a dialogue, to show, to show the board that we want the same things as they want. We're not, we're not trying to embarrass them. We're not trying to get one over them. We, we want the, the, the right thing for all shareholders. It starts with private meetings. It starts with developing a relationship. In Japan, it starts with bringing um, Fortnum and Mason biscuits, just to show that we are polite, friendly guys and we're not, we're not really out, out to get them. It's a lot of letter writing. Um, in, in Japan, there's a lot of education that has to go into um, what it is that we're suggesting. Remarkably, Company, um, company management in Japan, particularly at the small cap end of the spectrum, are very unsophisticated when it comes to understanding corporate valuations, um, the inefficiency that arises from having too much cash on the balance sheet, how it suppresses your return on equity, and what you can do about that by buying shares and cancelling them. So there's a lot of very detailed um, uh, letter writing. Um, obviously, we take voting very seriously. We vote in all our um, in, in all, our, all our companies, and that is a way of transmitting a message to, um, to management. And then in some cases, um, we can collab collaborate with other like-minded investors, and that um, is a more forceful or powerful message to management to, to listen to what we're saying. And ultimately, um, these things can go public if necessary. It's never our objective to go public and get our name um, up in lights in the press. 
Um, we always want to work behind the scenes and are happy with being out of the limelight. But sometimes, in some situations, companies need, it, need a, a push and going public can provide that push, particularly where management may feel uncomfortable about having, having this um, attack, sometimes viewed as an attack, um, in the public, public domain. Uh, what I would say is that going public um, is never our initial objective and it's always seen as a bit of a last resort and it's, it's only when all the other ac actions have been exhausted. On the next slide, um, we spoke a little bit about private, uh, proxy voting, but just to show our record here, we always vote. Um, we don't blindly vote in line with recommendations, either from management or from the likes of ISS. And um, this has certainly been the case historically. We analyze all the different um, resolutions and vote, vote according to what we think is the best interest for shareholders, not what is in the best interest of um, so finally, um, I'll, I'll leave you with a couple of examples just to put a bit of um, flesh on the bones. So the first example I want to talk about on the next slide is a Japanese company called Fujitech. Now, Fujitech is one of the top 10 global elevator businesses. And um, global elevator businesses are seen as attractive uh, businesses from the point of view that they have um, strong cash flows from all the maintenance contracts and all the upgrade contracts to their elevators and escalators that they've installed. So they've been very attractive uh, businesses, for, certainly for private equity investors, there's been a lot of corporate activity. And when you look at the valuation of Fujitech relative to the valuation of its international peers, you see a very substantial discount. Um, when we first bought Fujitech, it was trading at a mid to high single digit EBITDA multiple, whereas um, its global peers were trading at something like 20 to 25 times. So yes, Japan is a cheap market and maybe Japan, Japanese companies aren't always as profitable as they could be. But in the case of Fujitech, you had a business that was um, almost as profitable as its global peers, but trading at a fraction of, of the valuation multiple. And we highlighted a number of reasons behind that. Um, the first reason was that management had allowed cash to accumulate blindly on the balance sheet and the cash wasn't being put to productive use. And so that's a very inefficient use of the balance sheet and um, investors in Japan don't really value, um, value cash that sit up, sits idle on the balance sheet because nothing ever gets done with it. And so um, they ignore the balance sheet, they focus on the earnings side of things, they apply multiple to that, uh, but they apply a big discount to the cash value. And that, that gives rise to a big um, EV EBIT discount, multiple discount, uh, relative to peers. And one of the things that we've been working with, with management on there is to address the capital efficiency. The other big factor behind their valuation was the fact that they had a poison pill. And this really goes to the heart uh, of, of governance. So um, in the case of uh, Fujitech, some years ago, they had an approach from an unwanted predator. I say unwanted in, in, sort of lo in the loose terms. They, they didn't want to be taken over by a foreign company. And so they put in place a poison pill, which allowed them to dilute that unwanted shareholder to effectively zero uh, and boost everybody else. And that, of course, is a, is a very powerful weapon, but it's certainly contrary to the governance standards that we see elsewhere in the world and certainly contrary to the governance standards that we want to see in the company, because it acts as an impediment to unlocking the value of the business. Nobody else can take control. As we see here in the UK frequently nowadays, um, if companies are undervalued, other, other companies will step in, often private equity will step in, and, and that's what creates an efficient market. And Japan st suffers from a structural inefficiency because the market for corporate control doesn't work smoothly. And you have companies like Fujitech, which have got um, poison pills, but also, and this is repeated uh, in Japan and has been addressed, and it's a process, and it's improving, but still a long, a long way to go, is there aren't enough independent directors um, who see their role as, as being critical and challenging of, of management. Often in Japan, in independent directors where they do exist, simply tick the box and collect, collect their fees. So um, we had a three-pronged approach here with um, Fujitech. It involved lots of private meetings, lots of, lots of letter writing, expressing our views, um, and they focused on those three areas, 
capital inefficiency, cash on the balance sheet, not enough independent directors and where they do exist, not doing their role. And the most abusive of all was the poison pill and the need to get away with it. And ultimately, we chose here that rather than submit proposals to the AGM, shareholder proposals to the AGM and ask other shareholders to vote, we wanted to do more of an education process. There isn't any research written about Fujitech uh, by the sell side. And so we wanted to help investors understand the opportunity here and also the problems here. So we, we launched a public website. We published a 75 page document highlighting these deficiencies in the governance structure of the company and what might be unlocked if they were addressed. And it worked very well because we provided other investors with the tools to then approach management themselves in a constructive manner and make the same arguments that we had been making, um, make the same arguments that we had been making in a constructive way and, and really send the message through to management. And it worked. Um, uh, I'm pleased to say it's been a successful investment from a financial perspective, but also in terms of what we've asked com the company to do, we've had positive response. So the company have announced that they will be removing the poison pill at the June 2022 AGM. They've improved their capital allocation policies um, in terms of reducing, and reducing the amount of cash build up on the balance sheet and trying to target a higher return on equity, both from efficient balance sheet management, but also from um, making, making more. And then one final um, brief, brief mention for a family control on the next slide, the final slide um, is uh, Jardin Strategic. This is a Singapore, was a Singapore listed um, family controlled holding company. It, it's controlled by the Keswick family via a, a complex ownership web, but another listed company, Jardine Matheson, owned um, an 85 percent stake in it and um, some months ago the parent company made a bid to take over uh, the shares they didn't own in Jardine Strategic. The bid came at a premium to the prevailing share price but still at a discount to where we saw the net asset value. So it was um, nice to get a one-off jump in the share price um, and to benefit from that but ultimately the controlling shareholder who could vote their shares because it's a Bermuda domiciled company were able to buy, take control over the company at a 30% discount to what those assets were worth. So paying 70 pence for a pound of assets um, is, is, good, is good business um, for, for the parent company, for the controlling shareholder, but it's not good for us because we, we were forced to sell out at a discount. And um, in response to that, although the vote was um, because of the control, and we knew this at the outset, because of the control, they were able to push this through. Um, we nevertheless felt we had an argument, a case to be answered by the company that they had had, had a, a fairness opinion that was perhaps not so fair and, and perhaps misguided, and that a, a, a more appropriate approach to the fairness valuation um, opinion that they had commissioned would be to have regard for the actual asset value of the company. And so we've taken that to court. We're challenging it in court. It's a court case um, along with other shareholders. But just another re example of how um, we focus on governance. We use our experience of, of interacting with management and dealing with these issues to highlight where there are efficiencies and to take appropriate action uh, to protect the interests and safeguard the interests of minority shareholders. So um, I realize I'm running out of time. Um, so just in, in summary on the final slide, um, just to reiterate what I've said. Um, is there, is there one more slide there, sorry. Yeah, okay. So um, although we're not an ESG fund, um, ESG permeates what we're doing here. Um, it's part of the fundamental process. The, although we've spoken here largely about the G, E and S are core to our um, fundamental analysis and investment uh, ap approach to choosing appropriate investments. But governance has been a long-term feature of, of, of our approach. Um, we aim to, to be a constructive partner when it comes to engaging, not an aggressive bullying partner, but to be constructive. 
um, and we'll tailor our approach accordingly to, according to the situation. What works in Japan doesn't necessarily work with London listed investment trusts, and we have to be um, flexible when it comes to that. But certainly over time, our tried and tested, tested approach has promoted the interests of minority shareholders, has um, created long-term value for our shareholders, and will continue to be a core part of our approach to investment. So thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'd be glad to take them. Well, thank you, Joe, for another interesting presentation. Uh, actually, we've got quite a lot of questions come in in the sort of Q&A, so I'll try and push through some of those now. Um, first one, how do you allocate your time between the different cases? Oh, interesting question. I'm um, well, the answer is it's not only me here. So we're a team of um, 12 investment professionals. Um, and each, each analyst in the team focuses focus on certain types of companies and certain um, specific, specific companies as well. So we, we all sit in the same room. There's a lot of collaboration, a lot of discussion. And ultimately, the analysts feed up information and analysis and research to me. And in dialogue with them, um, you know, we take, we take um, appropriate action, we take opportunities. And even when it comes to the engagement, it's not only myself who's doing, doing the, the regular interaction with company. It's the specific analyst. And obviously I get involved when I need to get involved and take the lead on some situations, but um, it's, it's very much a team collaborative um, approach. Super. That very much ties into another question that says, how big is your team of analysts? Are all 12 investment professionals analysts? And do you still do research? Yeah, um, we all do. They're all investment analysts. They all do research. Um, I still do a little bit of research, but certainly less than I used to do. Yeah, um, that, that perfectly understandable. And I think like all people of my age, I would look at today's analyst and say, I could never have got a job when I was their age. They're much better than I ever was. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Um, next question. As a percentage, what size stakes does AV, AVI take in investee companies? Uh, that's so a very, very rate, good question. How much would you take of a, of a company? Yeah. It's a good question. I should have actually addressed this. So again, it differs. There's no one size fits all, fits all answer to this question. Um, if you take investment trusts, uh, we want to be, as I said, we want to be the largest shareholder and a dominant shareholder. And to that end, you often have to be larger than 10%. And um, a cap for us would be the 29.9% rule set by the, by, the, by the laws here. We don't want to create, we don't want to be forced to take over companies. So we're comfortable being in the high 20s, um, but typically in there you want to be more than 10% to get a seat at the table. In terms of family controlled holding companies, it's not really about the size of the stake because you know at the outset um, that you're not going to be the large shareholder, you're not going to be able to push things through. So it's always about determining whether you actually want to be a partner with that family, whether you think they're going to work for you as well as they're going to work for their family. And even with a small stake, with our um, experience and reputation in the sector, we can still have dialogue with the company, they can still listen to us, but it's more about being selective at an earlier stage and making sure we invest in the right types of uh, control situations. And Japan um, is, a little bit, is a little bit different. So in Japan, although they've got problems when it comes to corporate governance, the one good thing about the market there and, and the regulations there is that when you own 1% of a company in Japan, it entitles you to submit shareholder resolutions to the AGM. And in Japan, the submission of shareholder resolutions has historically been seen as quite an aggressive course of action, much more so than we're used to in other Anglo-Saxon developed markets. And it, it is, a, I would call an industry in its infancy. There are over 4,000 listed companies in Japan. And over the last five years, we've gone from maybe 25 resolutions to 50. So good pace of growth. But in absolute terms, not a lot of resolutions submitted to, to AGM. So with 1%, and particularly our focus on small mid-cap companies, it's readily attainable for us to own more than 1%. We can actually be quite a vocal shareholder. Um, we don't get public, we don't disclose our stake until it gets to 5%, but um, typically in Japan, anything from 1% to 10% is, is where we'd be comfortable. On that subject, do you think that you are a sort of trailblazer in Japan? I mean, is anybody else doing something similar to you? And are you able to collaborate with them? So we are, I, 
I wouldn't say we are the trailblazer, we are amongst a group of trailblazers. And certainly when the Corporate Governance Code and Stewardship Code were implemented as part of the third arrow of Abenomics five or six years ago, um, shareholder engagement was at the heart of what the government wanted to see as the mechanism for unlocking all, the, all of this value. And that really encouraged a, a group of investors, um, maybe half a dozen to a dozen investors to focus more on Japan and to take advantage of this activist, activist opportunity. In terms of collaboration, um, it's interesting. The, the, uh, the regulators are keen to encourage collaboration because your, your voice is much more powerful if it's sent from a, a, a group of investors than one single one. Japanese companies like to say, yeah, you're the only shareholder who complains, everybody else is happy. So if you can collaborate, that, that's great. What we found is that there's a lot of nervousness and anxiety on the part of Japanese investors from collaborating with a foreign investor. So although it's improved in the last couple of years, they, there hasn't been much in the way of formal collaboration. There's a lot of discussion behind the scenes subject to all the rules, of course, but discussion behind the scenes, and that, that can be helpful. Foreign investors do talk to each other to a greater extent, and we find amongst the dozen or so other so-called activists, we've got invest, investments in common, which we discuss. Um, we haven't as yet submitted joint proposals um, to shareholder AGMs. That's something that we discuss from time to time and could happen at some point. Okay, so related, sorry. So related to the um, trailblazing question, in the way that you sort of created the website with Fuji or Fuji Tech, has anybody else done something like that before? Yeah, there are other investors who have done that um, in, in Japan, and everybody's approach is is somewhat different. Uh, in the case of Fuji Tech, our approach was very much on writing the research that we thought the market was missing and doing a kind of an in initiation um, piece on, on the company. Others use websites just to articulate their arguments as to why the company is undervalued and what shareholders should do. So vote against this resolution or vote against that resolution. And I think there was a case actually, interestingly, a, a week or so ago where a very disappointed activist investor was so, di so disgruntled with what the company had proposed that they published on their website the email addresses of all the non-executive uh, directors and encouraged shareholders to send personal emails to all of them. We haven't done that yet. Right, okay. Um, next one is a sort of more stock specific question. Um, what do you think about share back or buybacks or the lack of for Pershing Square Holdings? Yeah, yeah, you know, it's an interesting question. Um, obviously, the starting point here is that um, it trades at a, a, a wide discount, and you can assume from the fact that it's um, our largest investment that we think that that discount is unjust, unjustified and unwarranted by the quality of the portfolio, quality of the management and the performance. Um, so as we know from running investment trusts ourselves, um, you, need, you need stars to align and you need to be proactive. You need to be proactive on marketing, you need to be proactive on delivering performance, or lucky on delivering performance, but you also need to be proactive on the buyback. And that is the one area where we've, we've seen a lack of progress. The, the point to make about Pershing Square, of course, is that although it's an investment fund, investment trust, and as I said in my presentation, when it comes to investing in investment trust, we like to be the larger shareholder and we like to use that position to force change and aggressively if we need to. Um, Pershing Square is kind of an exception because although its structure is, is akin to an investment trust, it is more like an, a family controlled holding company by virtue of the controlling or dominant stake that Bill Ackman has, has in it. Or in that with our eyes open, that it's more a case of um, we can engage, we can talk, but we can't pressurize. We, we don't have that much power in this case. And our investment case here is predicated to a greater extent on the quality of the underlying portfolio and the upside we see from that in investment returns rather than on assuming we have a pathway or an ability to force the company to do buybacks. But it's not to say we don't talk about it to them and we don't mention it and suggest it and push a little bit, we do. But we know from the outset that ultimately we don't have that much power when it comes, when it comes to forcing that. Okay. Um, next question, would you bother tackling an issue that looked wrong to you 
but that you didn't think was depressing the share price? So, so I just missed the beginning. Would, would you? Would you bother tackling an issue yeah. that looked wrong to you, but that you didn't think was depressing the share price? Yeah, I mean, yes, I think so. Uh, you know, we're responsible shareholders. And, um, you know, I think that well, you could say that there was, if something was wrong, it didn't depress the share price. But what I'd be concerned about was if they did something wrong, even if they got away with it now and it wasn't having an impact, they might do it again and it might have an impact then. And so I think that, yeah, we have to, it, it, it all forms part of our analysis. If we're seeing something that is not is wrong and not, not acceptable, then we need to we need to try and address it and raise it and think about it and not brush it under the carpet. Okay. Next question. How can you as an outsider know better than management what's best for a company? Hmm. Well, wow, that's a that's a big, big question. Um, You know, it depends upon how you define what's best for a company. And, um, you know, this is a big argument in Japan, of course, because, um, you know, we can say we're long term shareholders and maybe we think in years or decades in Japan, long term means centuries. So, um, you know, they, we can say they've got too much cash and the share price is, is depressed. They can say, well, in 100 years time, it will all come out in the wash. So um, that there has to be a bit of an understanding as to what the objectives of the company are and we have to be sympathetic and that's why in Japan we do things differently to the way we do things um, elsewhere but part of our approach is in not being that ignorant greedy outsider who just wants to get the share price up today so that they can fly back to London or New York um, with a 10 percent 20 percent higher share price and leave the company in, in a worse situation so although it's hard to say what's best for the company we can say what's worse for the company you know if if we're going to force a company to take on a lot of debt in order to fund the share buyback and lay off workers in order to boost margins, it's probably not a good thing for it to do. And so um, our approach is to be constructive, to try and understand what we think in collaboration with management, what we think is, is good for the company, is good for all the stakeholders, and it's not painful um, and work sort of more as a partnership with that and trying to build their trust and understand that. Um, but, you know, as I said in, in, in the presentation, um, when we come into a company, when we come into a company um, and we've done all the work, we've understood the business, that creates a more constructive dialogue than simply somebody coming in eat, um, greedily asking for something to, have to, to move the share price. And then, of course, our approach to um, research here in, ter in terms of in-house approach, we don't rely on the sell side. Our team's expanded because we're building expertise in these companies. Analysts at ABI should know the company as well as anybody else, if not better. And that creates a, a very constructive dialogue with management. Okay. Um, just related to Japan, I mean, how long do you think that the sort of corporate governance theme, that opportunity has to run? And sort of beyond that, are there any other regions or countries that offer a similar opportunity and you know, perhaps could we see a avi india opportunities in time you might you might um you know i think the interesting thing about japan is that for decades people have been saying it was cheap and um it was cheap for a reason and it lacked a catalyst and the implementation of abenomics and the corporate governance code etc was a catalyst finally for unlocking that value and uh, there are few, there are there aren't other markets in the world that I, I think have got that kind of catalyst to the same extent. I know Korea has been trying to tidy up their conglomerate structures, the Chaebols, and that's been an opportunity um, um, which played out quite well. But the, the thing about Japan is that it's not just tidying up a mess or tidying up a problem. It goes to the heart of the psychology, the corporate psyche in Japan um, has not been friendly to shareholders. And that's what we're trying to change. So I think it's a unique opportunity. Um, for now, we may well see ABI endure at some point, but no plans, no, no plans um, on the horizon as far as I can tell. Um, in terms of how long it will last, it's, it's very difficult to say. Um, I met with the senior director of the FSA when we launched our strategy in Japan, and he was at pains to assure me that um, the corporate governance code and the commitment to reform and shareholder interests in Japan 
was not a political thing. It would endure longer than any political individual, and it, and it would and it was that the whole country was taken seriously. But he warned me that Japan is a very traditional society, and everything takes longer than you can imagine. And so, whilst we can solve all the problems in Japan quite quickly, uh, I think the reality is that we have to be patient, and it will take longer than we hope. Okay. So next question, you must see some opportunities where you think things just aren't going to get better. Would you like to be able to short stocks? Yeah, you know, this is something that we think about um, and we definitely see things that, um, as the question suggests, overvalued and abusive to shareholders and running the interests of management or boards and, and families and, and the like. And, those are things that we think will destroy value over time. And yeah, often it's tempting to go short those things, but at the same time, we know that those things can remain inefficiently priced or wrongly priced for longer than we might be able to remain in business. So, um, you know, our skill set is, has been developed over many years on a, a long approach, long um, investment approach and engaging with them and solving those problems. Um, you know, we have hedged out certain risks at various points in time, but it's not an extensive, it's not a, a major part of what we do. And we may do more of it over time if we see specific situations, but we're not launching a uh, sort of long short fund anytime soon either. Okay. You clearly commit resources to corporate activity. Do you factor in a potential budget for this when you initially make an investment? No, we, we don't factor in um, an initial budget and it's probably to the detriment of our business because sometimes, you know, you, you start down a path, you've got to see it through and you've got to, um, and you've got to um, go all the way sometimes. And it's something that I should say, it's, it's, not, it's paid for by AVI, the management company, not by shareholders, the trust very often. So we're not like a hedge fund that can A, charge massive fees, but also charge all these expenses to, to their investors. So, um, we think about across the board of our business, we think about how much AVI will allocate to activism campaigns in any particular year. And probably over the last three years, we've blown our budget in, in each time, just because we, we've set down a path. And certainly when you involve legal professionals, it, it, can, be quite extent, it can be quite expensive. Okay. Um, I think we've probably got time for one more. Um, would you consider a zero discount policy? the trust well the, the discount policy on agt is set by the board it's not it's not set by me um, and the board obviously consider the discount on a regular basis at board meetings and um, they they implement the share buyback policy and it, it's something that they they take seriously and what i would say is that you know, there are pluses and minuses or advantages and disadvantages to a zero discount policy. Clearly, nobody wants to see the discount widen and the discount, the discount move to a, a wide level. And that's why the board have been explicit that they use the share buyback policy to, um, to address that, that risk, I would say. In terms of a zero discount policy, um, a lot of what we've spoken about, one, one factor I'll tell you that the, the board consider is the pool of capital that they have available to them. And clearly, we've been talking about um, shelter activism, the focus on governance. And a lot of the time, our ability to be a large dominant shareholder will determine the success or otherwise of our government, of our activist approach, approach to governance issues. And the board would be worried about shrinking the size of the fund to such an extent that we weren't able to carry out our investment strategy. So yes, we would consider a zero discount policy, but it's not something that the board has um, implementing right now. Super. Okay. I think we're out of time. So thanks, Joe. That was another super presentation. There's quite a lot of questions left over. Um, so what we will try and do is gather those together, perhaps send those over to you, and perhaps we can get some right. answers on our website for those.